Before me in the east, Nephthys, behind me in the west, Isis, on my right hand in the south is Set, and on my left hand in the north is Horus. For above me shines the body of Nuit, and below me extends the ground of Geb, and in the centre abideth the great hidden God. When we first started looking at the topic of blood, Charlotte asked me why Set is particularly involved in all these issues. And I have to say, it's like so much else, it's all about serendipity, luck and arbitrary choice. Well, in this presentation, we're going to look at an example of something where a little bit of serendipity leads us into some very interesting territory. There are many ways to show how important blood is in the old-time magical religion. So let's start with the famous ubiquitous image of the Ankh. It's the most famous of all Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's also one of the very few to survive into the Christian era when it becomes the early Christian sign known as Cairo, which most scholars would say the Christian Cairo symbol actually derives directly from the Egyptian symbol for the Ankh. Now the Ankh linguistically means as we all know, life. But one thing about Egyptian hieroglyphs is that they are pictograms. They're all pictures of something. So what object does the Ankh actually represent in real life? Now, there have been lots of different theories of this. Some say it's a representation of a sandal. In fact, the magician Alistair Crowley followed that interpretation, which was the scholarly knowledge of his time. But then, when we were looking at the actual meaning or what this object was, what the Ankh actually is as a physical object, we encountered yet another set of coincidences and serendipity. For it just so happens that almost exactly 100 years ago today, the exact date is, is not actually recorded, Margaret Murray participated in a groundbreaking public dissection of two mummies. These mummies come to be known as the Two Brothers, and they are displayed in Manchester Museum. And these mummies have turned out to be two of the most controversial of all mummies to exist in any museum almost anywhere in the whole world. Now, the controversy about the Two Brothers revolves around whether they are brothers or lovers. Brothers, lovers, or indeed twins, this is a very hot topic in the whole academic and scholarly realm of Egyptology. I should also remind you that this whole topic of brothers and lovers takes us right to the heart of the mythology of Horus and Set. Now returning to that very early dissection, the anatomist who was employed to dissect the two brothers soon discovered that one of the brothers was in fact a eunuch. And more than that, not only was he a eunuch, but he had undergone a remarkable operation known as sub-incision. Now the anatomist also suggested, from the way the genitals had been wrapped in the two brothers' mummies, that somehow the wrapping of the genitals was connected with the Egyptian Ankh hieroglyph, and thus gives it its core meaning. So in other words, the way the genitals of the mummies was wrapped, they were wrapped in the form of a hieroglyph known as the Ankh. Now, in 1966, the German medical historian Wolfhard Westendorf said more about this whole thing. He was studying a series of knots or bandaging spells in the London Medical Papyrus. And these spells were used to dam up bleeding from the vagina and anus to prevent miscarriage and thus preserve life. The physical artifact that is related, that represents this kind of knot spell, is known as the Knot of Isis. And one way or another, the knot of Isis is a prototype of the Ankh. Now, to give you an example of one of these spells, it's a very old spell, originally part of the Neolithic cattle cult of Hathor, and I'd say the god Set. And the first of these spells reads, Go back, companion of Horus, go back, companion of Set. Thoth repulses the blood. He has come from Hermopolis. He refuses to let the red blood come now. Do you not know the dam? Return, I say, in the name of Thoth. All this is said either over a red amulet or a bound menstrual cloth or tampon. We see Thoth then as the healer. We see Horus and Seth, the two brothers, connected with blood. We see Horus and Seth, the two brothers, connected with the menstrual cycle. 
and we see Horus and Set, the two brothers connected with the moon. And their companions are various ancestral spirits that are connected one way or another with blood. Mog thought that it would be interesting to weave our individual approaches together and do this talk in tandem, as although we use different magical tools, we have similarities in practice. The tools which we both use are a taboo subject, the study of which, in itself, acts as an initiatory device. By challenging the status quo of what defines us and that which operates around us, how can we hope to comprehend the worlds of spirits and the gods when we restrict our vision in this world? Now these tools could be seen as being demonic, in that we're working with spiritual forces which are often considered or represented to be negative or evil. Is this a deliberate choice of perhaps inflammatory subject matter, or, as Mog intimated, following an inner and very natural predilection? For myself, my obsession with blood is a very instinctive thing. Yes, there may be a conditioned goth shock quality in there, but there is also a pull that's always been present, and it feels very right to follow this path, despite the problems that may, and have, arisen along the way. Illustrated is a concept which could be seen to link our respective presentations. The Ankh has an Egyptian symbol of life portrayed as a loincloth or as a sanitary napkin. I will not deny a small and perhaps a cheap thrill in presenting such a different perspective of an iconoclast image. However, putting my vicarious thrills aside, I realize that the Ankh perceived in this way makes a huge amount of sense. Something which encloses the genitals, protecting them. Something which holds the menstrual blood holds the key to life and death and the mysteries therein. Last year I spoke on blood ritual as a taboo act at the Oxford Symposium, and this year I'm dealing with a specific, menstrual blood, and looking at its social stigma both historically and in the present, and its magical potentiality and its use in this context. Menstrual blood is as fascinating as venous blood, and its contradiction of holding both creative life force and death within it. In many ways, tribal societies could be seen to show their respect and awareness of this by making the menstruating woman a pariah who contaminates all that she has contact with. However, looking at the ostracization of menstruating women within contemporary monotheistic religions, this seems to have become more of an indication of misogyny. The menstruating Romani woman is known as mahrim, unclean. Islam and Orthodox Jews both hold similar religiously sanctioned opinions to the Romani, Although Orthodox Jews take it further, and during Nida, the time of a woman's menstrual flow, and for seven to ten days after the finish of a period, a husband and wife may not touch, even indirectly using an intermediate object. I've kept the examples used to illustrate the widespread view of a menstruating woman that's contaminated and unclean to a minimum, as I don't want to veer too much into territory dominated by gender politics. Male children in Papua New Guinea are considered to be contaminated by a woman's blood at birth and are not able to be cleansed of this until they are initiated into manhood. Then they go through a reenactment of their birth, but this time to an honorary male, actually a postmenopausal woman, and are thus reborn without contact with a woman's blood. This is an interesting example in that it seems to ally with the Christian belief of original sin and of a woman being the cause of this sin, which only a rebirth in the case of Christianity, a baptism can remove.